on a broad theme of the glory of God, um, I chose to take um, some passages from my favorite book, literally, the Psalms. It's not just sacred scripture to me, it is also my favorite book. I, I say this because it is the most honest book I have ever read. You know, in the same psalm, we'll see in just a minute, the psalmist in the same psalm will say, Lord, you are good, and then it asks, what are you doing? I mean, the psalms address all the vicissitudes of life. But throughout, there are two types of God talk. The psalmist talks about God, and the psalmist talks to God. And it's just in this, in this connection Life's experiences and God's glory, the, the Psalms meet us where we live, and I trust they'll do the same again. Let's pray, and then I want to read a Psalm to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray again that you would teach us your word. Help us to lay aside all filthiness and rampant wickedness so that we may receive with gentleness the implanted word that is able to save our souls. Help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only, lest we deceive ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 73. A Psalm of Asaph. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will thus speak, I would have betrayed the generations of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. 
but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Amen. Pastor, we good? Okay. <laughs> all right. Amen. Just checking. <laughs> I want to label this message, when good things happen to bad people. When good things happen to bad people. After the death of his son, due to a premature aging disease, Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a book entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. The book addressed theodicy, defending the goodness of God in the face of evil. Kushner wrongly concluded that God is good but does not have the power to prevent suffering. Yet that book became a runaway best seller. There's no doubt many people wrestle with the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Let me just put a footnote there. Bad things do not happen to good people. Bad things happen to all people. There's a technical theological term for it. It's called life. And R.C. Sproul used to say that bad things happen to good people only once, and he volunteered, <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ. While many people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Psalm 73 wrestles with the opposite question. Why do good things happen to bad people? The superscription above verse 1 simply reads the psalm of Asaph. Asaph was one of the chief musicians under David. He was the director of the Jerusalem Mass Choir, if you will. Twelve psalms are attributed to Asaph. Psalm 50, then Psalm 73 through 83. Asaph was a godly and gifted worship leader who had a crisis of faith. This psalm, before we get into the content of it, reminds us that those who lead are finite and sinful people just like those who follow. In this crisis of faith, the Lord sustained Asaph. And after his victory over this test of faith, he wrote this psalm to help others who face the same crisis. A, a part of my study process in a psalm is to kind of land on how scholars categorize the psalm. Psalm 73 is hard for scholars to categorize. It reads like a wisdom psalm but it is more testimonial than it is instructive. It begins like a psalm of praise, but it is not a psalm about deliverance from trouble. And then you read sections of it, sections feel like a psalm of lament. And yet, Asaph here is reflecting on the dilemma that he has already come through. I think it is best to read Psalm 73 as a song of trust. Asaph believed in the goodness of God. His faith almost slipped and stumbled because of the prosperity of the wicked. But the solution to his problem brought him back to where he started, the goodness of God. 
Psalm 73 asks why the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer. The psalm does not answer all of our questions. I'll admit that up front, but it does draw one conclusion that will help you stay on your feet and stay on the right path. The point, the take-home truth of Psalm 73 is that the wicked will not prosper in the end. That might not seem like big news, but it is. The economy of Scripture, the value system of Scripture, what matters in Scripture can be succinctly stated in one sentence. What lasts the longest is worth the most. That's the whole principle of the value system of Scripture. The economy of Scripture is based upon what lasts the longest. What lasts the longest is worth the most. The psalmist here reminds us that the wicked may enjoy the lifestyles of the rich and famous now, but the wicked will not prosper in the end. Why do good things happen to bad people? Psalm 73 answers by telling us to look to God and not to man with our questions. Let me walk you through the psalm under two big headings. The first lesson of this psalm is that faith struggles when it focuses on man. Faith struggles when it focuses on man. Myopia is nearsightedness or short-sightedness. Myopic vision sees things nearby. Far away things, however, are blurry. Faith can become myopic when you focus on the wrong things. It happened to Asaph. Verses 1 through 14 describes what you might rightly call a case of spiritual myopia. It begins with an honest confession. In verses 1 through 3, the writer contrasts how faith stands and how faith stumbles. Notice first how faith stands. Verse 1 begins with this emphatic certainty, truly, surely, Asaph affirms the existence and the character of God in three words. God is good. This is the foundation of faith. Who are the beneficiaries of God's goodness? The psalmist says God is good to Israel. He he provides for and protects his covenant people. But He is especially good to those who are pure in heart. Purity of heart is not about sinless perfection. It is about wholehearted devotion to God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. Then verse 2 tells us how faith stumbles. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps nearly slipped. Asaph almost slipped and stumbled away from God. Why? Isaiah chapter 48 verse 22 reads, There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Asaph believed that, but verse 3 says he saw the wicked prosper. Prosperity is the Hebrew word here for peace. If I can say it this way, Asaph saw wicked people living their best life now. And the word saw is a gaze, not a glance. 
The warning of Psalm 73 is if, if you focus on the wrong things, it'll trip you up. You've got to focus on the glory of God, not the greatness of man. Asaph focused on the wrong thing, and he became envious of the arrogant. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says, envy makes the bones rot. And Psalm 37, verse 1 gives the solution, does it not? Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. But Asaph said, I almost slipped and stumbled because I became envious of the arrogant. That's his honest confession. But when you move forward, you'll see in verses 4 through 11, his warped perspective. These verses describe the prosperity of the wicked. He describes it three ways, prosperity, pride, and profanity. He begins with prosperity in verse 4. They have no pangs until death. He says it just looked like wicked people in the world suffer no life-threatening troubles. While people around them are starving to death, their bodies are fat and sleek. Verse 5 says, they are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Th listen to what he says. Everybody else is stricken with trouble, but it seems like wicked people enjoy a carefree life. But not only does he mention their prosperity, he mentions their pride. Look at verse 6. What a statement. He says, therefore, pride is their necklace. The wicked wear arrogance like a status symbol. Church, does this not sound like the culture we live in filled with people who are proud of what they should be ashamed of? As the prophet says, we live among people who don't know how to blush. So violence covers them as a garment. The, the wicked, the suggestion of this psalm is that these wicked people become prosperous by social injustice, be it legal or illegal. And they don't hide it. Violence, he says, is characteristic of them like, as if they are wearing name brand clothes. You would think they would try to hide their wicked deeds. They, they wear it like a garment. And verse 7 says, their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with folly. The language there indicates that they are consumed with spiritual indifference. They are overflowing with spiritual folly. Notice their profanity in verses 8 and 9. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. He says the world is filled with their insolent speech. Verse 10 says, therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. This is a tricky verse in the psalm. But it seems what he is saying is that these people are wicked, terrible people, but because they are rich and famous, people seem to follow them without question. Verse, two, verse 11 asks two blasphemous questions. How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? In other words, the wicked think that there is no consequences to how they live their lives. Verse 
which gets to a spiritual dilemma. There's an honest confession, a warped perspective, and then a spiritual dilemma. Verse 12 summarizes the previous verses. Behold, just look at this situation. They, these are the wicked. They are always at ease. They increase in riches. Asaph's warped perspective created a spiritual dilemma for him. He concluded in verse 13, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. He, he concluded that being godly is worthless. It seems like you try to live right and face trouble and you do your own thing and the world celebrates you. In fact, he does not just suggest here that being godly was worthless. He suggests that it is counterproductive. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. He says the godly suffer affliction while the wicked enjoy prosperity. And so the prosperity of the wicked upended Asap's theology. Asap was thinking like Job's friends. He assumed that the righteous are blessed and the wicked are cursed. And what he saw was the direct opposite. I need to move on, but just make a note. Here is a rebuke of prosperity theology. Faith in God does not guarantee health and wealth. The wicked prosper in this world. And if you focus on it, it will lead to stumbling, not success. And so that's the first half of the psalm. Faith struggles when it focuses on man. The second half of the psalm teaches a second lesson. Faith triumphs when it focuses on God. I mean, it's a simple progression. Verses 1 through 14 are about the prosperity of the wicked. Verses 15 through 28 are about the downfall of the wicked. The point of the psalm is that the wicked will not prosper in the end. But what I want you to see is that Asaph only saw this truth when he stopped focusing on man and started focusing on God. Note first in this section, the turning point. For some, the, the verse that has been my friend over the years from Psalm 73, and there are a lot of big verses in this psalm, but this psalm, I, was, I met this psalm through verse 15. If I had said, I will thus speak, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Social media makes people feel free to say whatever they think. Asap here said, I did not say what I felt. Because if I would start talking and express the doubts I, I was having, it would have betrayed the generation of God's children. It's as if he is saying, if your feet are about to slip, free speech can drag down others with you. This verse has been a friend to me in those moments when I have been down and discouraged. It's taught me to ask God for the holy discipline of shutting up so that I don't act like when I'm going through something that God has not been faithful. He says, when I was going through this, I, I just, I didn't, I didn't talk about it. He writes this psalm in the aftermath of this test of faith. 
But he says, I, I didn't say anything that would betray the sense of God's faithfulness to the generations of his children. It's simply, I need to move on. This is simply a reminder of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. But only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it would impart grace to those who hear. Verse 16, when I thought about how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. He couldn't understand how good things were happening to bad people. It wore him out trying to make sense of life. But then there was a turning point. Do you see it? When I thought about how to understand this, verse 16, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went to the sanctuary of God. Let me be, let me meddle for a moment. I'm glad and grateful for those of you who may be watching online. But ASAP says here, no live stream service would have kept me from stumbling and slipping. I needed to be in the house of God to worship the name of God with the people of God. And when ASAP beheld the glory of God, he saw everything else clearly. I hope you've kind of got this, this thread that's run through these messages. It's when you see God in His glory that everything else in life begins to make sense. He says, when I went into the sanctuary, then I discerned their end. What end? Psalm 37 verses 10 and 11 says, in just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Watch his, the proper perspective. After this turning point, there is the proper perspective. Verses 4 through 12 record Asaph's warped perspective. But through God-centered worship, through God-glorifying worship, he gained a proper perspective. Seems like the, the wicked in their prosperity are standing strong, but he says in verse 18, truly you have set them in slippery places. And you make them fall to ruin. Remember, Asaph almost slipped and stumbled. Now he realizes it's the wicked who are in a slippery place. God will make them fall to ruin. Verse 19 emphasizes the sudden downfall of the wicked, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. It, it doesn't take long and it doesn't take much for God to bring the high and mighty down. Verse 20. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. It may seem that God is doing nothing about the wickedness of the world, but God will soon rise up in righteous judgment. And the wicked who seem so great will be like a bad dream you can't remember when you wake up. The old bumper sticker says, the one who has the most toys at the end wins. My question is, wins what? The one who has the most toys at the end still dies. And Jesus is right. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What 
does it profit a man to live in a big house in, in a gated community with a guard at the gate, but your soul is homeless before God? What does it profit a man? to drive a fancy, expensive car with two names on the hood. But your soul is thumbing a ride before God. What does it profit a man to wear designer clothes with a European designer's name on the label, but your soul is naked before God? Hear me clearly, friends. God created us, and we are accountable to him. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God sent his son, Jesus, to die at the cross for our sins and raised him from the dead. Whoever turns from their sins and trusts in Christ will receive free forgiveness, new life, and eternal hope. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 and 27 says, And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Oh, friend, I plead with you today, run to the cross today and trust in Christ alone for salvation. The rest of this psalm describes what I want to call a new orientation. (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't call this. This is uh, Walter Brueggemann in his famous commentary on the Psalms. He, I, I read uh, as a young man, and he placed all the Psalms in three categories. There are Psalms of orientation, reflecting Psalms where you meet God, and the beginning and the joy of the relationship is, is so wonderful. And then there are psalms, he says, of disorientation. When troubles come and doubts arise and battles are fought. And then there are psalms of new orientation. When you have trusted God and seen him bring you through. It's interesting that that Psalm 73 begins with disorientation, but it ends with new orientation. Verses 21 through 28 declare three truths about God that can keep you from slipping and stumbling. Three truths. Number one, God is faithful. Verses 21 and 22 says, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in the heart, I felt brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. (laughs) Asaph's soul was sour, and his heart was pierced through. He was brutish and ignorant. Asaph could not understand God himself or the world around him, and so he was like a, he says, like a beast toward God. He said, I was acting more like a monster than a man. Now we see, though, his problem was not the prosperity of the wicked. His problem was that his own heart was not right with God. Verse 23 says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. I hope you get this. Asaph is now admitting, my problem was not with what the wicked was doing. I had strayed away from God. But here's the good news, friends. Asaph strayed away from God, but God never left him. He survived because God, listen to this language. He says, God held his hand. 
Verse 24, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me in glory. What a statement. In the present, God guided him with his counsel. This is Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But while in the present, God guided with his counsel, he says, in the future, God will receive me in glory. The wicked will not prosper in the end. The righteous will not suffer in the end. He declares, there will be glory for the saints after this because God is faithful. But not only is God faithful, the second truth of this psalm about God is that God is sufficient. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? Answer, no one. I want to be very clear about that. Who have I in heaven but you? The right answer to that is no one. Heaven is not about patron saints, guardian angels, or family ancestors. My help comes from the Lord, says Psalm 121 verse 2, who made the heavens and the earth. Asaph adds, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Oh, friend, do you believe that? There's really nothing on earth desirable, truly desirable, except God. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He who has, who he who has God and everything has no more than the one who has God alone. Hallelujah. That's a word of warning for those of us that have God and other stuff. You will inevitably reach a point in your life where that stuff will not be sufficient. But when you get to the place in your life where God is all you have, you will then discover that God is all you need. God is all we have in heaven. God is all we need on earth. Verse 26 says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Physically and spiritually, Asaph was at the point of death, but God was the strength of his heart and his portion forever. In Canaan, the promised land, God gave each tribe a portion of land. The tribe of Levi did not receive any land. Numbers 18 verse 20 explains why the Lord would be their portion. And that's what Jesus is for us. He's our sure and sufficient and satisfying portion. In Christ alone is everything that we need. God is faithful. God is sufficient. And one more truth about God in this psalm. It's where we started. God is good. Verses 27 and 28 contrast the destiny of the wicked and the godly. Verse 27 says, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. To be far from God, Thomas says, you could make that choice, you could, you could live far from God, but that's a choice with consequences. Psalm 1 verse 6 states those consequences in blunt terms. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish.
unfaithful. Everyone who is unfaithful to you. Unfaithful refers here to spiritual infidelity. It can refer to spiritual prostitution. Psalm 106 verse 39 says, Thus they become unclean by their acts, and they have played the whore in their deeds. Chasing after the worthless things of this world, but God will put an end to the unfaithful. But verse 28 says, But for me it is good to be near God. Hear me, being far from God is a choice with consequences. But I declare, being near to God is a choice with consequences. James 4 verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Asaph says, I made the Lord God my refuge. I told you in the last session, it, it's a, a refuge is a safe place, a strong tower, a panic room. I have made the Lord my refuge. Why, Asaph? That I may tell of all your works. In the end, Asaph refused to complain. He refused to complain, and now he determines to testify. Friend, do you have a testimony of the goodness of God? Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Literally, if the Lord has been good to you, you do not have the right to remain silent. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from trouble. God is good. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these psalms that address the very real realities of our lives and the world that we live in and yet point us beyond the things of this life, the things of this world, and bid us to look to you who is unwavering in faithfulness, sufficient in your provision, and good in all your ways. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to behold the glory of the Lord and be transformed from one state of glory to the next by the working of your wonderful Holy Spirit that lives in us. Bring every sphere of our lives under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Guard our hearts from complaining. But fill our mouths with your praise. You are faithful, that you are sufficient, that you are good, that you are wise, that you are sovereign. You are holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with your glory. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.